There we go. That that radius helps define that circle. And if I was to actually physically pick that radius up and trace it around, that radius touches every single part of the circumference of that circle. So when it comes to a, a number plane, knowing how to find a radius is absolutely key to finding the equation of a circle. Having a look at what we've got here in terms of a number plane, and if we want to think about that that point there, it has the coordinates x, y. Is there any way possible of knowing the length of that radius without knowing anything more than the coordinates of where it starts, which was 0, 0, and the coordinates of where it ends? The y-intercept. Well, the y-intercept is actually here down in the center at 0, 0. Um, where y steps where it's crossing a y axis. So we, we've got one end of our line at zero, zero. The length of a line equation. Yes, Bailey, it's exactly right. The length of an interval. A length, um, and, and when it comes down to the length of an interval, um, for those of us who can't remember, the interval, um, the length of an interval is x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. And then you take the square root of that. Uh, what does that look like? Yeah, Pythagoras. All right. So circles are just an extension of Pythagoras. And down the track, if we think about circles being as an extension of Pythagoras, that's going to help us out when we get into trigonometry down the track. So if I just scroll along here, you can see here I've created a circle. I've got another circle that's drawn a little bit better. And what I want to do is just quickly, I want someone to be able to tell me what is the length of that radius? Well, that was pretty dodgy. If it's three units by four units, what would R equal? Yeah, R is going to equal. Yeah, so R is going to be five units straight away. So we have a circle here that's five units long. And it doesn't matter where we look at the radius on that circle. Over here, that's three units tall by four units. That's still going to give us five, even though it's minus three and minus four in terms of where its, it's x coordinates and y coordinates are. Um, it's still going to give us a value. And it doesn't matter where we pick any point that along that circle, that that's going to stretch out. What we can think, though, is that because it relates to Pythagoras, um, a circle with its center at the origin is given by the equation that x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared. And, and that's our equation of a circle. And hopefully you can see very easily that that was just quickly gained from just applying Pythagoras to, to a straight line and then using that straight line as a radius and, and scribing a circle in a number plane. Is there any queries with that? Beautiful. All right, so a circle with the center of its origin is x squared plus y squared equals r squared. Now, let's jump on board and look at, well, if we know the equation of a circle, how does the circle, how can we translate? How can we move that circle around a um, the number plane? And when we want to move a circle around, there's a couple of things. We can make a circle bigger or smaller by just expand, making the radius bigger or making the radius smaller. But that's not moving the circle around. That's just expanding or contracting it. I want to know how can we move it around. And if we, we've noticed that the radius was dependent on a starting point. So if we move the center of the circle around, we then... So we were saying, talking about moving the center of a circle. So can anyone remember back to parabolas? How did we move the vertex of a parabola left or right? A horizontal movement in our parabola. What did we end up, how did we manipulate that equation that made a parabola move left or right? Yeah, x plus three all squared. Yeah, we, we, we changed x squared and then we made it a perfect square. We made x plus three all squared and then that helped move it. x plus three, yes, Ethan, that's an example. That helped us move it left three units. The same thing would happen with a circle. If we want to move a circle horizontally, 
we would do um, we would add or subtract something to x inside the brackets and then square it. So there, hopefully on the screen, you can see x minus a or squared. And and whenever you change the value of a, that's going to shift the circle uh, horizontally. If that's what we need to do to shift the circle horizontally, we've got to do the ex we can do the exact same thing to y and, and shift it up and down vertically. So to shift y up and down vertically, we would then impact y, make it y minus b or squared. Is that okay? Cool. And what I'm going to do, we're, we're just going to quickly jump over to Desmos. So you can see what I've set up in Desmos up in the top line here. You can see I've got x minus a all squared plus y minus b all squared is equal to r squared. So there's our uh, an equation of a circle. And that's what we call our general equation. Like that helps us describe to understand if there's been any shifts in our circle up or down. X plus Y or X squared plus Y squared, that's a very unique circle that's origins at the, it centers at the origin, sorry. Um, here you can see, and when I click on A and change the values of A, you can see as I'm changing the values of A, the graph's moving left or right, making a horizontal shift when I change values of A. Um, it's important, let's just think about what's happening and let's pick a nice number, negative three. When I substitute negative three in here, what we're going to end up with is x minus negative three. So we've got two negatives in a row, so that just becomes x plus three all squared. And when we have x plus three all squared, the centre moves to the left the same way that that would do with the parabola. And you can see if we, when we change values of b, that's going to change a, a vertical shift for us. It's going to make the, the whole center of the circle move up and down. And let's pick there. So here we have a, a circle. It centers at negative three, four. And you can see down the bottom here, I've got a radius of eight. Does anyone want to have a go at predicting and, and having a type in right now? What is the equation of that circle? Yeah, x plus 3 all squared plus y minus 4 all squared equals 16. That, that's better, 64. Uh, just be careful, guys. Remember, it's r squared, so h squared is 64. Um, so if I was to type that in here, we would have x plus 3 squared plus y minus 4 uh, squared equals 64. And when you see that we've typed x plus 3 squared, that gave us the black circle, which is exactly on top of that red circle, which we just, just produced. So by manipulating those A and B values inside the brackets, it, it moves the center of our circle. And obviously changing R changes the size of our circle, the diameter, the radius of the circle. Any questions on any of that about moving a circle, shifting it left or right, up or down? One thing I want you to notice and take important note is that we need to think about that X minus A all squared and y minus b all squared, they are perfect squares. And we need to think about them as being perfect squares. Um, can anyone think why it might be important for us to think of them as perfect squares? No, not yet. It comes in handy for finding the center of a circle. And I'll get on to what I mean from there. So to find the center of the circle, the coordinates of the center, the x coordinate and the y coordinate, well, they're found, we've got to do two separate things to, to find the x coordinate and the y coordinate. And we kind of saw that a second ago when we looked at moving the graph, the circle around on Desmos, and that's when each individual bracket is set at zero. Um, the importance of y where that is set at zero, if we think about all the way back to the beginning where we said, how is a circle made? And it was Pythagoras' theorem from the center to the edge. So we need to know where the center starts. So if the center isn't at zero, zero, that's when we're using that interval, the length of an interval line. So we need to know when inside each of those brackets, 
do we get a, a zero so we can get the center of our, our, our circle? So it's just a matter of setting each of those individual parts to being zero. So if we go down and, and look at this example, um, what are the coordinates for a circle with the equation x plus 5 all squared plus y minus 2 all squared is equal to 16? Well, the x coordinate is when x plus 5 all squared is equal to 0. And when does x plus 5 all squared equal to 0? Yeah, when x equals negative 5. And the y coordinate is when y minus 2 squared equals 0. So that happens when y is equal to, to positive 2. Therefore, the center is at the coordinates negative 5, negative 5 and 2. The other reason it's important to know that this circle, okay, let's, let's just expand on this now, where the center of the circle is, because I'm going to ask you now, what is the maximum value that this circle has? What is the highest point in its range? Can anyone figure out what its highest point in its range would be? And maybe describe, you can turn your microphones on and describe how you would find that, I think it would be a bit easier than typing. Uh, it, it, cause it's a circle, Michael, um, it's, it's got a top somewhere, so it's not going to stretch all the way to infinity, right? What's the radius of this circle? Let's just start there. Go back, look at the equation. What's its radius? Yeah, it's got, it's got a radius of four. Um, so this circle, it's, it's radius is just the square root of 16. So it's got a radius of four units. Of course, it's got a radius of four units. We know that the circle, the circumference of that circle is always going to be four units away from the center of the circle. So in terms of its range, the highest point it will be with the maximum value that this circle will take on is four units directly above um, the center. We know the center is at minus five, two. Um, yeah, Marcus, beautiful. So, um, the highest point it will be is at, at six. Its range will only stretch up to six, which is four units above the center. Um, same with the lowest part of its range, we're only stretched to four units below the center. In terms of its domain, like where the circus circle actually exists, it's again, four units either side of, of its center. So its domain would be from um, minus nine to minus one four units either side of negative five. Is that okay? Yeah. So the so finding the center of a circle is super important because it, it allows us to describe the domain and range of a circle. So for fun, here is uh, example two. Can you state the domain and range of that circle for me? Cool. So hopefully guys, you are able to figure out that the center of that circle was at negative seven zero. Um, and that the square root of 25 is five, so we have five units. Um, so its domain is x is going to be an element, and we're going to use square brackets because we've got because because we've got a circle, it's actually physically touching the ends, and its domain is going to be five units below negative seven, which will give us negative 12, and then it will stretch to five units above negative seven, which is negative two. And apology, my square brackets. I'm, you know, never really good at drawing them first up. And then the same thing with our range. Our range will be five units above and below zero. So our range, so y is going to be an element of, um, and five units above, so negative well, below to five above. Any questions with that one or that? That felt pretty comfortable. Why is it negative two? Um, in terms of, uh, whoops. Uh, negative two, um, if I have a number line and we know that the center is at negative seven, because it's got a radius of five, the edge of the circle is going to be five units that way and five units this way. And so five units then gets us to negative two and negative 12. Cool. 
Why is it five in the range? Um, for the same thing in, in the range, Rhea, the centre of the circle is at zero because the centre is at zero and it's got a radius of five. It's going to be five above and five below zero. Oh, whoops. Thank you. I made a mistake. That should be plus y squared in the equation. Thank you, Alex. I got carried away. Um, Ryan, which is probably why it doesn't give you a circle in Desmos if you change that to a plus. Thank you for picking up on that. Uh, my bad. Cool. All right. Uh, let's move on to uh, another example that's along those same lines. And this one, all I've asked you is what is the center of a circle with the equation x squared minus 6 plus y squared plus 4y minus 3 is equal to 0. Issue with this circle, this equation, is that it's, it's not neat for us. It, it's not something as simple as x squared plus y squared equals r squared. It's not in that form. It's not in a form of x minus a or squared plus y minus b or squared equals r squared either. It's not in any of those forms, and that's annoying. Remember earlier how I said it's important to note that they are perfect squares? That's where our, our knowledge and our understanding that a circle has perfect squares comes in to helping us. So what we're going to do is we are going to rewrite, um, rewrite this equation in this form here. Because once we can manipulate that into that form there, we are able to um, figure out our circle and go from there. So the first thing we need to do is we need to figure out a perfect square of x values and a perfect square of y values. So if I have a look at this equation, the first thing that's annoying me about this equation is that there's this minus 3 there. That minus 3 isn't attached to an x, it isn't attached to the y. So the first thing I'm going to do is x squared minus 6x plus y squared plus 4y is equal to 3. I'm going to move it to the right-hand side. Everyone cool with that? Yep. And by moving it to the right-hand side, on my left now, I've got, I can deal with just x's and just y's. And when I look at the left-hand side, I'm going to, I'm going to look at this slightly differently now. I'm going to think about this as, well, x squared minus 6x plus something, plus, oh, let's undo that, y squared plus 4y plus something was equal to 3. Has any, does this feel familiar to anyone? If we go back to early term 1, maybe even some parts of U10, depending if you did 5.3 or not, where we look at a perfect square, yeah, Ruben, spot on. We're, we're looking at completing the square here. We know that our x values have to be a perfect square, but we don't know what it is. So we're going to complete the square. So we're going to add values. Remember to complete the square that what we're adding to complete the square is we need to add um, 6 over 2 squared and we need to add 4 over 2 squared. We've got to add them in because that's what's going to help us complete the square here. So if I just copy that, paste that down here. So what I'm doing, I'll rub those parts out. 6 over 2 squared is 9. Because 6 over 2 is 3. So if I add 9, that now makes the x part a perfect square. Uh, 4 over 2 is 2. When I square that, I get 4. That makes now the y part a perfect square. And I can't forget that on the right-hand side, I also need to add my 9 and my 4. And what we are left with is the x part. That becomes a perfect square because our middle term was negative. That becomes x minus 3, all squared. Our, our y brackets... Because our middle term is positive, that becomes y plus 2, all squared, and 3 plus 9 is 12, 12 plus 4 is 16. Was that okay? Yeah, so this 
hopefully earlier in the year when when we looked at quadratics and we looked at completing the square and we said hey even though that when we're solving quadratics if the two main things to do was either factorize or use quadratic formula was completing the square yes it worked uh, but it, it was a bit time consuming when it comes to circles it's the only way to to do a circle it's the only way to to complete and find the centers so um, therefore the center of this circle is going to be at three negative two and it has a radius of four units cool any questions on that oh we got rid of the negative three to the other side michael because because at the very beginning that negative three um we don't know if it's part of the 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 x part or if it's part of the y part so by getting rid of it to the other side um it allows us to have no no coefficient there no no random number there and allows us to complete the square nicely it allows us to add anything we want without complicating it too much i hope i hope that explains that a little bit i don't know if it was very clear or not cool all right so we've just done a whole heap of stuff on circles we've just looked at how to find the center of the circle we've looked at its radius we understand that a circle comes from pythagoras and that our circles are very important that they've got perfect squares it's x minus a all squared plus y minus b all squared gives us a radius squared um, let's now go on and look at just quickly semicircles so if i just go quickly to um, focus back on x plus y squared equals r squared well a semicircle comes when we rearrange this formula to make either x or y the subject of it so um, what i'm looking at here is i'm going to with this one rearrange it so y becomes the subject so the first thing i'm going to do is take x squared to both sides so y squared is equal to r squared minus x squared and then the last thing because y is still not my subject yet it's it's still y squared is i'm going to find the square root of both sides and what we are left with is y is equal to and we know a square root is got to be a positive or negative r squared minus x squared now depending on which one we're looking at is is what way our semicircle will take shape so if i just quickly well, um, go up hopefully that rearranging wasn't too bad if we were to take the positive of that square root that means y is only equal to positive values the other thing that it's important to remember is that inside the square root symbol you can't be left with negative numbers so y can never equal a negative answer that's why we've got a semicircle that sits on top of our x-axis was that okay the idea that the square root can't have a negative so that's why there's there's nothing exists below the y-axis sorry below the x-axis um so our our um range is limited from zero to to whatever the radius of the semicircle is and then the domain is okay if we want to look at the semicircle that sits below the x-axis what we need to do is then we need to look at the negative values of the square root is that okay looking at the, the square root symbol in, in two different ways any questions on that all right so semicircles are just rearranging the formula of a circle because they're just rearranging the formula of a circle the way that we move them is the exact same way that a, a circle would move we look at changing the center of the circle so if we just quickly go over here and i'll go over here here you can see um that was weird um that I've got my equation of a semicircle. Notice how it's uh, the positive part of the square root symbol. And because it's the positive part of the square root symbol, um, that's why the, the semicircle exists on top. Um, 
notice again here, I've now gone out with this one. Um, notice there's A's and B's. So when you rearrange um, rearrange it if it was Y minus B, this is what you would be left with. And remember by changing values of A and B in the circle that moved it, the same thing would happen here by changing values of A and B, it would shift it up and down and changing values of R would expand our semicircle. So you can see if I will change values of A inside that bracket there, that means the center of the semicircle is shifting left and right again, the exact same way that um, it would do if it was a complete circle. Uh, I'll just bring that back into view. And with the exact same way, if I change those values of B, it's going to shift that entire semicircle up and down. Is that okay? The important thing to notice here is that a semicircle, and I'll bring you back to my iPad now quickly. Uh, where's my iPad? Is that a semicircle, if I was to draw a vertical line, when you have a semicircle that's in the form y equals, it passes the vertical line test everywhere. So a semicircle in the form of y equals passes the vertical line test everywhere, even the negative part. And because it passes the vertical line test everywhere, we can say that a semicircle, when it's in the form of y equals, is a function, whereas a circle, a full circle, is not a function. Is there any questions on, on that part of semicircles, that a semicircle is just the rearranging of a formula, but all the other aspects of circles still apply, the moving of the centre and its radius, and that just the fact that that semicircle becomes a function. Any, any questions on that? And I know it's pretty much recess now, but just quickly, one last thing I want to show you is what happens when you make X the subject, when you make X the subject, the semicircle is then the right-hand side or the left-hand side uh, of the semicircle. Um, and you can see when I put a negative sign in there, it flips the semicircle over the axis. Um, the center and everything else still moves the same. But when X is the subject, we now no longer have a function because you can hopefully all can imagine there that that, that semicircle is going to fail the vertical line test. All right, any other questions or queries before we wrap up today's lesson? Cool, I'm assuming by the silence, we're all good. Um, hopefully that, that helps. Homework, Dave, up on Math Space, there are some questions. It's a little, if there are 25 questions, um, some of them are very quick and short, others of them require a little bit of thinking. Um, that's not due till the end of the week. So just take your time, do a couple of questions, come back to the task. Um, and just get that finished off and that should wrap up our circles topic.